Lauren Dowden for Conduit News, and today we have law professor Robert Steinbuck joining us here to talk about a number of issues happening across the state. Hi, Robert. Hey, Jenny. Great to be with you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. It's been at least a week or so since you've been on Conduit, so there's just a lot to catch up on. Indeed. First, I want to talk to you about the FOIA constitutional amendment. You are working with that group. Um trying to get that on the ballot for 2024. Talk to us about where you guys are and um, just give us an update. Yeah. So by way of background, you, of course, recall, because you were in the legislature day and night uh, when mm -hmm. twice, uh, one in the end of the last general session and then during the special session, uh, there were two bills, both sponsored by Representative David Ray, uh, that sought to really undermine transparency in Arkansas. Uh, and we beat back the first bill in early, most of the second bill uh, in the special session, uh, but they've already said that they were are looking you know, for the future to bring back those notions to restrict uh, transparency in Arkansas. And so a group of folks got together and I was invited to join to help craft a constitutional amendment that will protect in the Constitution, obviously, therefore, with more strength, our uh, Freedom of Information Act notions. And where we are right now is we have come up with two proposals, one for a constitutional amendment for the broad principles, and then an initiated act. That means a statute, but one passed by the people rather than by the legislature uh, for the specifics. Uh, and we're about to release that. We've released version one, which was all a constitutional yeah. amendment. Uh, and we went around the state uh, getting comments, public process. This is an open process. This is a Imagine process. That. Right, right. This is a process by the people for the people. So yeah. we, a, a handful of us get together to, to be scribes, really, to write mm -hmm. down ideas not to dictate outcomes. Well, and then, what are you hearing? What are you guys hearing as you've been going around? I know you've had several town halls. That's right. Uh, what have you been hearing from people as you've had those town halls? Uh, very positive comments uh, in general, I will say overall, meaning uh, that uh, we have gotten uh, essentially no pushback from the notion. Mm -hmm. What we have gotten are very good specific comments about, hey, uh, we think you need to focus more on this issue or you need to tweak this issue that way. Uh, and those recommendations are being incorporated into version two. Uh, and that's the key, right? As you know, after David Ray's first bill failed, the attorney general uh, um, instituted, created a so-called working group, a FOIA working group. But there was nothing and is nothing transparent about it meaning we haven't heard a peep about it. They've met, but they haven't done any road shows like we've been doing. They haven't done anything out in the open. And of course, the attorney general complained, well, the, the implication is that this must be a meeting. Nobody said that. Yeah. Nobody said that. What people have said is you should be open in your process. And why don't you do that? And he said, well, uh, I have a lot of meetings that aren't public. Your meetings, you don't attend these meetings. So we're not talking about your meetings. You're, we're talking about meetings of your so-called working group. But here's my real question. Then I'll get off the topic of this working group because I think it's probably better characterized as a group that's not particularly working well. So the not <laughs> particularly working well group, uh, here's the interesting thing about it. While the not particularly well working group uh, was underway, David Ray proposed his second FOIA killing bill. So it, I'm at a bit of a loss to understand how you have a working group with participants who aren't working with the group. They're working also separately. So now I think the whole notion uh, that that working group is functional uh, is largely um, defunct. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. So talk to us about what's soon to be released. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'd love to say it's finalized. It's not. We're we're, we're still tinkering, but what, a lot. We, we, it's it, you know the, the, it's so challenging when you take 
good ideas from people and then to try to put it down on paper. That's the real difficulty. Yeah. Uh, and we're doing it, but you'd, you'd think it's a lot simpler than it is. So the constitutional amendment sets forth these broad provisions uh, regarding transparency. And the critical part of the constitutional provision, as has already been released, is that if the legislature wants to change transparency laws in Arkansas, and they want to make things more transparent, have at it, normal process. Yeah. But if the legislature wants to make tra uh, government processes less transparent, well, then there's a different process entirely. You've got to have two thirds of the legislature and then a vote of the people. And that's the key insight of this whole project, I think. And then on the the legislative side, or excuse me, the statutory side, which would be the initiated act, we are um, bringing parts of the FOIA forward, some adjustments, some none, uh, some, some the same as they were, um, so that we can have this uh, updated Freedom of Information Act. Where are we with the ballot title? Of course, the ballot title hasn't even been tackled yet because we have to finish the drafting before we can craft the ballot title. Okay. And of course, we are all concerned that the attorney general uh, is, is not going to approve the ballot title, not because it shouldn't be approved, uh, but rather because he has a rather generous view of his role in the ballot title. And we know this, right? We know this because there was a ballot proposal just given in for an initiated act to remove the tax on feminine hygiene products. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and his response was, you didn't say that feminine hygiene products doesn't include toothpaste. So, uh, and I'll expand on that in a minute, but Ginny, you are probably somewhat more familiar with feminine hygiene products than I am, mm -hmm. but I dare say that uh, I'm comfortable enough saying that feminine hygiene products doesn't cover toothpaste. And what he actually said was there's a law out there on the books right now um, put together by one of these national groups seeking to tax us more. And we adopted that law several years ago. And that's why you pay an internet tax when you buy something from uh, Amazon. Uh, their definition of ha feminine hygiene products in that law that's wholly unrelated to this uh, says Feminine hygiene products are these feminine hygiene products, and they're not these other feminine hygiene product products. Uh, excuse me. They're not these other products, including things like toothpaste. Well, that's just silly. And the fact we that- We know. Right? And the fact- We know. And the fact that someone decided to put that in that law has nothing to do with the better written version that was in this yeah. proposal. And he right. said, no, you got to copy their definition. Well, mm -hmm. no, you and that is because the attorney general has a very generous view of his role in the ballot title process. And I wrote about this, by the way, uh, in the yeah. Democrat Gazette. And he wrote back a largely substance-free complaining about my column. He couldn't name my name. He said, that that uh, columnist, uh, that regular columnist, I'm not Voldemort. You can actually write my name down. It's okay. <laughs> It's okay. You Remind can say it during a special session. Right. Remember, and then, I'm sorry, but then the next day you're like, "No, you can." Say, it was me. It's me. Stomach. I think it was the, the previous night before uh, Senator Hester. You know, kind of. Oh, that was no, no. That was the same heated, night. But it was was it that night? And no, <laughs> that's right, right. And so the senator came in and said, "You know, there's some folks that are calling." legislators and making a muck of all things. And I'm not going to name names. And I said, Senator, my name's Robert Steinbuck and you can use it all you want. Oh, okay. We digress. Okay. Yes. So anyway, well, yeah, the, um, so we'll yeah, see what happens title. with the ballot that title. Is not, that is something that, you know, could be tricky. I think, I think the group that, you know, wanted to, uh, with the, the, the learns, um, the anti-school choice group with their, that, that was something that they really had a, you know, a problem with and, um, not to say that I think that this is anything nefarious at all, but it seems that the ballot title issue can be um, a bit of a hang up. Well, and the ballot, the, the role of the attorney general in the ballot title process is simply to make sure that you're not voting yes 
on something that you really want to vote no on, that that the title is so misleading that you're actually voting the wrong way. And that, that's that has happened. That's right. But, yeah, and that's a risk. But, right. you know, as with mission creep, uh, uh, you have the same thing, bureaucracy creep, right? Yeah. Mission creep being a sort of a military notion. And in government, you have bureaucracy creep. And you have folks given some authority uh, always expanding that authority, or maybe not always, but often. Um, and so we have to be on guard for that. And yeah. the the role of the attorney general is limited. I described it in my column. Uh, the attorney general wrote a response to that column and said largely nothing. So if you want to see what the role of the attorney general is in uh, writing, in evaluating ballot titles, take a look at my column from, from a few weeks ago in the Democrat. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, I would love it if they would uh, put as much attention to some of the bill titles from some of these legislators. Literally, it will say, you know, one thing in the bill is completely different. And but that that, you know, no one seems to have a problem there. Um, right. Anyway, OK, any hurdles that this group is facing moving forward that you see? No, I mean, it's a, j just the process itself is always a challenge. Yeah. And that's a, right. We have to get 90,000 plus votes for the amendment, 70,000 votes, if I recall correctly, for the initiated act that is going to be paired with that amendment. Of course, we're going to have those signature forms side by side. So it's not yeah. like it's 160,000. It is in number, but almost invariably, a person who signs one will sign the complimentary one on the spot. So it's that part won't be uh, any significant additional amount of work. But still, collecting 90,000 signatures from uh, at least 15 counties, and some have said it's more, depending on your interpretation, and I don't know the answer to that question. It's either 15 or 50 for some reason. Um, uh, whatever it is, uh, okay. you know, take some time. Yeah. All right. Well, also, uh, the last time that we had you on, you and I, this was right after October 7th, and we uh, briefly spoke about the anti-Israel pro-Hamas um, rallies that were happening all, ac all across the country. They were just beginning to pop up, mainly in the Ivy League institutions. Uh, just this morning, today's Wednesday, just this morning, the University of Arkansas canceled um, an anti-Israel panel discussion that they were happening, that they were having this evening with two uh, very, um, it was just a very imbalanced panel. And so uh, we were pleased to see that. Well, it was unbalanced, to be clear, I mean, right? Yes, so, unbalanced. Right, meaning yes. there was two anti-Israel folks, uh, uh, and that's it. <laughs> so yeah. there's no balance at all. It wasn't yeah. off balance. There was no balance. There was, you're right. Right. I was being, yeah, I was probably being a little too generous there. Um, talk to us about your thoughts on that. It's really remarkable that uh, what's going on across academia, um, throughout the country, and perhaps across the world, mm -hmm. uh, because the leftists are coming out of the woodwork and yeah. they are letting themselves be seen for what they are, right? Uh, today, Anti-Semitism comes from the left, not from the right. Uh, and indeed, Arkansas, uh, we see this in Arkansas academia, but we see it elsewhere. And Arkansas, as a state, of course, is very good. Uh, in 2017, uh, Bart Hester uh, sponsored a bill that says, if you're going to be a vendor uh, to, to the state, you have to sign a pledge that you're not boycotting Israel. Now, remember, these boycotts were created by people who want to destroy Israel, and they are an attack on Israel. They're nothing shy of that. And so uh, Bart uh, wrote this wonderful bill that became a law. <coughs> Excuse me. And fast forward to today, essentially, I mean, a week or, or so ago, uh, there was a fellow who was invited to speak at Fayetteville. And uh, they asked him, therefore, to sign the pledge because they were going to sure. pay for him to come. And he said, I'm not going to sign that pledge. And so they said, good riddance. And the governor yeah. and Bart Hester both correctly said, good riddance. 
And then, of course, you know, the histrionics of the left came out and they said, oh, well, this is anti free speech. Uh, no, you want state money. That's not speech. That's right. commerce. And if you want the state money, you have to sign the pledge. But here's the deal. If you want to come to the university and not get paid, you're welcome to. Yeah. And that's how we demonstrate it's not speech at all. But this is commonplace, right? This is, we, we, the left is so anti-Israel and there's such a thread, or maybe I should say rope of anti-Semitism in the left today, they don't even see it. Here's an example. You know, they talk about all the time, well, anti-racism, that's their big pledge, anti-racism. Here's a 2020 statement made by Arkansas academics. And it says, we are resolute to listen to the voices of the African-American community, as well as leaders of other marginalized groups, including members of the Latinx, indigenous, Asian, Arab, and LGBTQ communities, among others, as we seek to eradicate racism in all forms. Here's my first question for you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Where are the Jews? Yeah. Where are the Jews? Did you hear that group? Lat Latinx, indigenous, Asian, Arab, LGBTQ+, no Jews. They don't even see it. They don't even hear it. By the way, last time I checked, LGBTQ+, is not a race. But I'll just put that aside. Uh, it it's good to be against all forms of discrimination. But where are the Jews? Well, maybe, Jenny, maybe I'm mistaken. Because Jews haven't had much of a history of racism, have they? Do they teach history to these yeah. academics? Take further, when there was an article written by a leftist paper about Hester's bill, here's what they said about Hester. Uh, he's a belligerent evangelical who sponsored the 2017 anti-boycott bill in a bid to get himself and fellow Christian nationalists to heaven faster. They don't even hear how yeah. biased how right. how anti-Christian a statement that is. By the way, is that all it takes to get into heaven? Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is it. The progressives so readily exempt anti-Christian attacks and anti-Semitism from their phony, phony anti-racist ma mantra, they don't even see their own hypocrisy. You know, equality for only some isn't equality at all. That's right. the problem here. Yeah. And you know, look look around the state. Who are the most inclusive, if I may borrow a term, of Jews? It's mm -hmm. evangelicals. Yeah. Look at Jason Rapert, who's the founder of the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. Israel and Jews know no better friend than Jason Rapert. Mm -hmm. The left, not so much. Not so much. Look, I, I said before that this uh, um, uh, uh, notion of Boycotting Israel is a creation of Israel's enemies, is a direct attack on Israel. Who's a big fanboy of the boycotts? Well, the Palestinian prime minister is. Mm -hmm. This is the same guy that refused, refused to condemn uh, both the murder of 1,400 innocent civilians and the kidnapping of 242. To this yeah. day, they've been held for a month. They want, they talk about these corridors to get in aid to Palestinian civilians, but I don't hear anybody, anybody on the left talking about releasing civilian hostages. It's it's unbelievable to me how it's, silent but, the left is look, about it. Look, but the left has, is just entirely filled with this hypocrisy and inconsistent positions. You see uh, what frauds you see what frauds they are and I retweeted the Babylon bead today and he was talking about um he was talking about uh it, it was only a few years ago in which uh I talked about this with Jay Green it was only a few years ago where if you just simply misgendered someone or if you you know that was an act of violence That's we right. have people on campus now literally saying kill the Jews or from the river to the sea you know uh, Palestine will be free. What does that mean? When you yeah. ask them what that means, that means a complete eradication 
of Israel and its people. Right, because Israel sits between a sea and a river, right? That's right. That's right. It's quite simple. So they can say all of those things, literally violent, genocidal talk. And it's hypocrisy, right? That's the point. They're the ones that are the word police until they ain't no more. That's right. Right? Uh, I mean, look... The left is so embedded in word salad. They're so embedded of stripping meaning from words and just using them as tools of power. After all, what is the left, right? The left is the development of the Marxist movement. And the Marxist movement is about using any means necessary to exert power to get your outcome. So that's yes. what we're seeing today. Part of when you hear, oh, well, uh, we should have a two-state solution uh, to Israel, including a right of return. Wait, what? What was that last part? Say the, say the lefties and the Palestinian right. prime minister, the right of return. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Mm-hmm. They say mm-hmm. that Palestinians should have a right to return uh, after two states are created to Palestine? No. Right. To Israel. Wait, wait. Break down this hokum if you can. Let's create two states, one for Palestinians, one for Jews, and then have Palestinians move into the one for Jews. You know, it's like asking your neighbor to build you a house, and when he's finished, you move into that house and his house. Yeah. What? Yeah. You can't rational. You cannot rationalize. You cannot make sense of of this. But the overarching thing and what I've seen so many people, Barry Wise, I'm not sure if you follow her and her new um, outlet called the Free Press. I mean, brilliant stuff. And she's talking about how this just shows why it's so important for DEI to be completely dismantled. We're seeing all of this come to a head across all of these institutions. And it was never it was never about, uh, you know, these these this woke squad. It was never about any of the it was it was never about really being injured by, you know, it's not about inclusion, right? It was about, it's not not about any of their words. No, it was a ruse. It was about control. It was about control of our institutions. It was about control over a banking system. It was about control over corporate America. That's what it was all about. And then now it's like, oh, you know what? Um, They can't come back from this. They can't ever come back and try to say words or violence again. And, oh, you misgendered. Get out! Get out of here with that. Yeah. Well, that's it's, right. Did it's, you ever it, it, think in your lifetime that you would see um, what we're seeing at other campuses right now? Um, yes, you did. Yes, I did. Why? Because I've tracked the development of the left for for decades now, and we have their plan was right out in the open. Yeah, they embraced Marxism and the tools yeah. of Marxism. So we saw it from the beginning, but we let it go. Yeah. Right. And so now it's time to go ahead. Yeah. Well, do you think though, I mean, is it possible to, I mean, I I also see people saying, oh, well, people are waking up, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, big funders at universities um, pull their donations, but do you, and not to be a pessimist, but do you almost feel as though it's gone too far or do you think that it can be reclaimed academia yeah. well that's a wonderful question and and i'm not i think my answer is i don't know right yeah. i i never want to give up on trying i think one of the things and i've spoken about this in a number of contexts over many years is we need to pursue inter- intellectual diversity on campuses right because what was the left about pigment and plumbing oh what color are you uh, what, what's your plumbing? Mm-hmm. How does it affect my thinking, right? And then you get all of these my truths and all this kind of make-believe nonsense. There is no my truth, right? Yeah. There's the truth. Whether you want to believe it or not, I guess is whether you put my in front of it. Right. You can have your opinions, but not your truth. Yeah. But like we've been discussing throughout this conversation, the left strips words of their meaning and then puts their own meaning and their own meaning, by the way, is not just a new meaning. It's not a development of a word. It's this is what this word means to me today for this purpose. But tomorrow, it'll mean something else, particularly if you want to use it. That's how the left operates. 
Of course, lawyers are not supposed to operate that way, right? We're supposed to take words and use them ubiquitously. We're supposed to use them no matter who the person is uh, involved in the issue. And so that's the irony when you see leftism across this country in legal academia, how they do some, uh, uh, they do uh, uh, um, just contortions uh, over how they interpret things depending on the circumstances. Yeah, before I let you go, the, the University of Arkansas, the Honors College, they said that it was to be rescheduled to spring semester. Do you think we'll see that happen next spring? I don't know. I hope we you do. Know? But here's the thing. I hope we do in a fashion that reflects the highest ideal in academia. Maybe not yes. the highest ideal in the world, but the highest ideal in acad academia is the competition of ideas. Yeah. Right? It's not indoctrination. It's learning. I have no problem. Some might even be surprised. No problem. If those two lefties want to spew their venom and spew their misguided approach to reality, as long as there are other people involved who get to say exactly what I just said. Right. Right. Get to share our views, rational well, views conservative views, views that respect humanity, views that say that the butchering of 1,400 individuals is a war crime, the views that say that kidnapping 242 innocents is a war crime. We need someone on a panel talking about the war in Israel against Palestinian terrorists who is willing to say that. And if you can't find that person in your academy, doesn't that tell you something? And I think, as as uh, Jay mentioned in our interview yesterday, I, he didn't think that the university had anyone to offer. He said, exactly. I don't think they even have just a realist perspective to offer against these two professors. I'm happy so, to drive up. Oh, that'd be great. I don't know what to tell you. I'm happy to come. Yeah. Well, maybe so. Maybe so. Well, Robert, thank you so much for joining us on Thank Conduit. you, Jenny. Always good to, to be with you. Back next week.